My name is David Armstrong, and I'm the director of the Health Workforce Tactical Assistance Center. Today's webinar is about a comprehensive overview of the National Dementia Workforce Studies. Uh, we have Donovan Mosk, the multiple principal investigator of the National Dementia Workforce Studies. He is at the Black, he's a Black Knee Research Professor in Geriatric Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. And we're also joined by Joanne Spetz, a principal investigator of the National Dementia Workforce Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. And she's also the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, and of course, director of the University of California, San Francisco Health Workforce Research Center on Long-Term Care. And once more, my name is David Armstrong. With that said, Donovan, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take over. So I, I started the slides, but Joanne will do the talking. <laughs> uh, she'll start us out and then I'll and then I'll join towards the end again. Yes, indeed. Um, so in our in our division of duties, we agreed that I would um, start off our presentation. So thank you for coming to learn more about the National Dementia Workforce Study. Um, so I think for many people in this audience who are knowledgeable about health workforce issues, um, some of the knowledge on this slide about the growing need for people to provide health care services specifically to address rising numbers of people with dementia is probably well-known information. Um, the costs of health care for a person living with dementia are quite high, much higher than for those without dementia. And by 2040, it is estimated that the total cost in the U.S. will be about $1.6 trillion dollars. There are millions of workers that support this population, and they have a lot of influence over the quality of care, the costs of care, access to care, um, and in particular, direct care workers who include personal care aides, nursing assistants, and home health aides play a very large role in supporting people living with dementia. That said, we don't know a lot about the dementia care workforce and the influence that they have on quality outcomes for the populations that they serve. Um, this workforce includes a lot of different professionals ranging from specialized physicians through the direct care workforce, which is really the largest group of people in this area of work. And so this is an opportunity for us to study them. Um, next slide, Donovan. So the National Dementia Workforce Study was um, established through a request for applications that was released by the National Institute on Aging. And that um, request for applications noted that specifically they said what is missing from this literature is how care is supplied to people living with dementia and what decisions are made by providers and institutions that lead to wide variations in care for people living with dementia. So this RFA um, sought applications to establish an $81 million cooperative agreement over five years um, to create a data resource for researchers. And this is a really key point. Um, this project is not about creating data and then us holding on to it and doing studies all by ourselves. It really is to create a data infrastructure for the research community nationally to be able to study this workforce and how it influences care for people living with dementia and how to improve quality of care, financial incentives, operations, whatever people want to find from the data. So this is a family of workforce surveys that can be linked with patient outcomes and facility data. Um, there are also are pilot grants to accelerate the use of the data. And um, this is all really aligned with one of the milestones um, in the National Institute on Aging's um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research implementation milestones as noted on this slide. Next slide. So the team is um, cr crosses the United States. Um, we've got multiple institutions involved. The leadership of the program is um, with Donovan uh, Maust and I, our uh, multiple PI. Um, administratively, this is based at University of Michigan and UCSF is the kind of major partnering, partnering institution. Um, other leads of different cores of the program are James Wagner, who is at the University of Michigan Survey Research Center. He has decades of experience in survey research and specific expertise in non-response bias. 
Um, Laura Wagner here at UCSF, who is involved in our Health Workforce Research Center on Long-Term Care, is leading the Pilot Studies Corps, um, along with folks at University of Michigan. And Stephen Marcus, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, is lead of the Data Linkages Corps. Um, and then we have other partners at Alzheimer's Association, UNC Chapel Hill, Brown, Yale, Mathematica, um, and then consultants at other organizations, including um, Bianca Frogner, who is at University of Washington and directs um, the workforce centers that are funded by HRSA there. Next slide. So what we are doing is a family of four surveys. Um, and so the first survey is of community clinicians. I'll describe all of these in more detail in a few minutes, but community clinicians, which we define broadly to include physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. Um, so basically it's all the licensed folks that could bill for their services. Um, the nursing home staff and assisted living staff and home care staff. And for all of those um, staff, there are also going to be organization level surveys for the organizations in which they work. For those surveys for year one, we're focusing on the licensed nurses and the direct care workers, such as the nursing assistants, personal care aides and such. Um, in future years, we might expand that workforce to include um, maybe social workers or others. But for this first year, we're just focusing on the licensed nurses and the direct care work. Over the full five years, there are going to be more than 75,000 surveys. Um, so this is an enormous data set that's going to be developed over time. Next slide. So for the community clinician survey, as promised, um, I will tell you more about that. Um, so for physicians, we are narrowing the group for year one to be the people who really would be um, primarily responsible for the regular management and diagnosis of individuals living with dementia. So this would include primary care, um, internal medicine, family medicine, um, specialists with geriatrics and neurology and psychiatry backgrounds. Um, because those are the people that are really the point people for dementia care. We also are including nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And for those groups, there are not specialty identifications available in the underlying claims data. So we're um, going to just not narrow them by specialty. Um, for all of these clinicians, we are focusing on people who have billed Medicare or Medicaid for any patient with a dementia diagnosis we also are looking at encounter data for the Medicare Advantage plan, so it also would be people who have essentially reported any encounters with people living with dementia. So we're beginning by identifying patients that have a dementia diagnosis in the past year, and then um, from those individuals we're looking for the clinicians that have billed for them in any setting. Um, we also are looking at pharmacy claims because we know that incident to billing means that some advanced practice clinicians don't show up in the regular encounter claims data, but you can um, kind of take a look at the pharmacy claims to identify some additional NPs and PAs that might be providing direct services. And then in step three, we're stratifying that frame based on clinician type, clinician setting, um, dementia panel size, rural urban location, um, the percent um, of their patient population that's enrolled in Medicaid or kind of dual enrollees and um, and or Part D receiving a low income subsidy so that we have some stratification based on the socioeconomic characteristics of the Medicare enrollees. So over the five years of surveys, there's going to be over 20,000 surveys. Some of these we anticipate will be longitudinal, but probably the longitudinal surveys will not will be like every other year or every third year, not on a year to year basis, because we do not anticipate that this um, workforce's patterns of care or workforce connections um, change as frequently as they do for some of the other components of the workforce. Um, these data will all be linked to claims data using the respondent NPI national provider identifier and Donovan will be talking more about that in a few minutes. Next slide. The nursing home staff survey is nursing homes with any dementia residents, which um, honestly we thought at first that we might look at specifically um, to identify nursing homes with dementia residents, but the estimates out there in the field are that 
nursing homes typically have 30 to 50 percent of their residents have dementia so we um did not we determined it, there was really not any additional value in screening the nursing homes on the front end for that because it's a pretty safe assumption that they have at least one person there with dementia um so we're developing a stratified frame of nursing homes and then recruiting facilities to participate in the study um, those nursing homes that agree to participate in the study are then being asked to complete an administrator survey, so we have some information about the facility that might not be available in other public data sources about nursing homes, and we are asking them for a roster of their staff. We are then sampling from those rosters, um, and our number of um, surveys that we anticipate over the five years is going to be over 19,000 surveys. These data then will be linked to Medicare and Medicaid claims, minimum data set, the payroll based journal administrative data, um, other various data sources that you can link using the facility, um, the facility identifier numbers. Next slide. So the assisted living staff survey is using a very similar methodology of developing a sample frame of communities. Um, for that, we've had to rely on state licensing lists, and we are oversampling those that we know have memory care wings for the states that identify that in their licensing data. We're then recruiting those facilities to participate, asking them to complete an administrator survey and roster their staff, and then sampling from those rosters. Um, for this set of organizations, we'll have nearly 16,000 surveys. Some will be longitudinal, as will some of the nursing home staff surveys. Um, in coming year, in year two, we will use some methods developed by Callie Thomas and Helena Temkin Greener and others to use nine digit zip codes of Medicare beneficiaries to identify those that live in assisted living. Turns out for some of the larger assisted living facilities, um, they basically have their own nine digit zip code, so if you have a beneficiary that's in that zip code, you pretty much know that they live there. Um, you do miss the smaller facilities through this method, but you do get about 85% of Medicare um, enrollees that are thought to live in assisted living, if I remember the numbers correctly. And then that would enable us to link those individuals living in these facilities back to Medicare and Medicaid claims. Next slide. Um, the last of our family of four surveys is of home health and home care staff. So in year one, we are focusing on home health agencies um, using the agencies registered with CMS. So this would be home health um, facilities that primarily are doing kind of short term home health services, often after an acute health event like a hospitalization. We're um, developing a stratified frame and then recruiting facilities or organizations, in this case, to participate and um, have the administrator survey that asks about types of services provided. Um, we are doing a screener, and so if an organization says, well, actually our home health services are only for younger people, or um, we would never take a person with dementia because we do not have the capacity to handle that, then we are excluding them in that initial screening process. But then the rest of the process looks like the facility surveys, um, an organizational survey, obtaining rosters from the facilities or the, the agencies, and then sampling from those rosters um, with a target of over 20,000 surveys over the five waves with some of those being longitudinal. And data linkages, honestly, we are still working on different strategies to do that because um, at the, in our wave one, we do not want to also leap out there to agencies and say, by the way, we also want um, social security numbers for all of your clients. We, we think that that is probably a little bit too much to ask for when we're in this first year of recruitment. And we are going to be um, trying to figure out how it is that we're going to link the client's data so that we can then look at the quality of care and how it is linked to this workforce. Um, we're also in a lot of discussion about how to expand the frame. Right now we are collecting licensing lists from the states that license home care agencies. And for year two, we anticipate that we'll be doing some sampling from that list. 
but we're still um, kind of figuring out and brainstorming with some experts in the field about how to seek out people who might be independently hired and not going through agencies. So to give you a sense of the different strata, um, this slide shows you the different um, kind of dimensions of stratification that we are using um, in the process of selecting and determining how many um, organizations or individuals we're surveying. For um, the nursing homes, assisted living and home care, we have our initial sample selected as 200 for each with a goal of recruiting 100 organizations for each. Next slide. The survey questionnaires cover a number of domains and all of these questionnaires are on the National Dementia Workforce Study website, so you can download these. Um, the key survey content for the staff and for the clinicians includes demographics, questions about education, training, and experience, um, including dementia-specific training and knowledge, um, questions about employment status. So for clinicians, it's are they in a small practice, large practice, who else is in their practice? And for the direct care workers, it's are they full-time, are they part-time, do they have multiple jobs? Um, there are questions about their dementia care knowledge, attitudes, and practices using established um, and psychometrically validated um, batteries of questions, um, as well as, honestly, some questions that we made up. There's no psychometrically validated set of questions around clinicians um, prescribing practices related to dementia, so we used our expert knowledge and various consultants and input from the research community about what to ask. There are also questions about working conditions. Whoop, go back. Working conditions and organization practices, um, which would include um, things like stability of um, client or resident assignments for direct care staff, and then questions about worker outcomes, which would include burnout. It would include um, stress experienced on the job, occupational injuries, experiences of harassment and stress in the workplace, and other sorts of factors. Um, and the year two surveys are going to have even more questions related to some of these worker outcomes. Um, the direct care worker and nurse surveys for the facilities and organizations, um, basically everybody who we survey in year one is also going to get a year two survey to learn uh, about their retention, if they leave their job, why they left their job, and then if they're staying in their job, what has attracted them to stay in the job. Next slide. Um, all, as I mentioned, there are administrator surveys, and these are gonna be asked of all the assisted living, nursing home, and home care um, organizations. And this includes some information about the practice setting and characteristics that might not be available in public data sources, the training that they are providing, um, the benefits that they offer to their workers. Um, the workers then have questions about what benefits they actually use and are enrolled in. And then uh, questions about spe dementia specific care related to hiring, training, and continuing education. Next slide. Now I'm going to hand it off to Donovan to um, talk about the link data. Sorry, sorry, I was a little over eager in some of my slide turning, uh, Joanne. Um, okay, so the home stretch of the slides we have are around the linked data. And so really one of the key goals of what the RFA and what the NIA was looking for was the ability to um, not just survey the workforce and really understand the workforce, but then to look at how those workforce characteristics and composition are actually associated with outcomes and the, the type of care that's actually delivered um, to persons living with dementia. It's one thing to ask a clinician about the type of care that they're providing. It's another thing to be able to objectively look in data to see the type of care that they're providing. And so the linked data uh, is really important to sort of flesh some of that out. So we think about sort of four levels of the type of linked data, and I'll just walk you through those right now. Um, so the first level of linking data um, is actually, so Joanne mentioned that there will be, for the three organizational surveys, nursing home, assisted living, and home care, there will be the staff respondents on between eight and 11 staff within each sampled organization. And then there's also the administrator survey. 
So you could imagine if you look at what the administrator says about the organization and the training and the structure and the benefits, that would be very useful to combine with the staff surveys. So that's the first sort of um, maybe most simple level of linkage is combining the administrator and the staff surveys from participating organizations. Um, the place where you can learn more about the various types of linked data are on our website. Um, helpfully, the, the links are, are in the chat. Um, and if you go to the data linkage, just data linkages box and page is where you'll find out more information. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here on the slides a little bit. Let's go back to the four levels. So there's combining the two types of survey. Um, there's thinking about the environment or the context of where care is delivered. So you can imagine um, the availability of nursing home beds or home health agencies within the county might influence the type of care that a given facility offers that um, uh, clinicians are able to and provide and also sort of job opportunities um, say for a respondent who leaves and goes to work for a different nursing home, whether or not they do that depends on how many nursing homes are in the county. Um, so we have a number of different uh, data sources available that are at either the county or the state level, including something called the ARF for the Area Health Resources Files, um, the Social Deprivation Index, which is a measure of socioeconomic status at the county level that uses census data. Then at the state level, we have Medicaid spending reports. So the amount of a given state spending um, that is on uh, say institutional services, nursing home services versus home and community-based spending. Um, and then uh, finally, AARP the, uh, re releases their LTSS report card. So long-term services and supports state uh, report card or scorecard that ranks all 50 states. Um, on about 50 different um, metrics related to older adults. So those are geographic linkages or environmental linkages that are available there under bullet number two. Um, and now I'll advance the slides to talk a little bit more about bullets three and four. Um, so I just walked through the geographic data that are available. Um, th then bullets three and four are basically different data sources available through CMS um, using CMS identifiers. And so the most straightforward example of that is for the community clinician survey. So if I'm a respondent for that survey, my survey data um, goes into what's called the linkage platform, which is um, supported by the NIA. And that's where all of these data linkages, it's a cloud-based environment where these data files will live. So the survey will have my NPI. And then because it has my NPI, which Medicare uses my national provider identifier, there's all different types of data that are available using that clinician NPI. For example, you can get actually beneficiary level um, claims data. So all of the encounters that I have with my patients in Medicare or Medicare Advantage or Medicaid, all of the prescriptions that I write, you can, through the linkage platform, get the linked beneficiary level claims and assessment data. So for all of the respondents who are community clinician survey, you know, primary care, geriatricians, psychiatrists, neurologists, nurse practitioners, PAs, you can get all of their beneficiary level claims data for the patients to whom they provide care. Similarly, for our nursing facilities that are participating, there will be their CCN number that Joanne mentioned earlier. It's the CMS certification number, which is like the federal identifier for nursing homes. That then can link to a whole host of different data sources that we will have available within linkage. Um, that includes what's called the payroll-based journal data that nursing homes have to report, um, nursing home compare, um, something called LTC Focus, which is out of Brown University and has all sorts of um, nursing home processing quality metrics. So all of those will be available within linkage for researchers to use. In addition, like with the community clinician survey, because you have the facility CCN number, that allows you to get all of the resident MDS assessments for every person that resided in that nursing home. 
And then once you identify all of those people, you can then also get all of their Medicare claims and all of their um, Medicaid data. So an enormous data resource available. And then finally, we're going to prepare uh, what I'm calling uh, claims-based summary files. So I just mentioned uh, uh, all of the beneficiary level Medicare data that will be available to link with the surveys. The challenge of that is these data are enormously complicated to work with and you, you yourself, um, or you need to work with a team, with a data manager, a data analyst that really has expertise using these files. Um, and it's, it's not trivial to work with these data. So what we wanted to do to sort of accelerate and facilitate researchers' use of these data was to create claims-based files where we do the work, or I should say Mathematica working with us will do the work to use beneficiary level claims data. So for say all of our respondent clinicians, we'll develop uh, characteristics around their panel size overall, the panel size um, numbers of patients with dementia, the um, gender of their panel, the age of their panel, the race and ethnicity of their panel, the rurality of their panel. Um, does this clinician provide telehealth visits? Do they provide home health visits? Um, what are their prescribing patterns like? What percentage of their panel uh, receives an antipsychotic or an opioid or a benzodiazepine? So we've um, basically, we've done the work with the raw beneficiary level Medicare data in order to generate what we hope are useful um, panel level measures for researchers to be able to explore research questions about the care delivered without needing to actually work with the raw claims data themselves. And we've done a similar thing for the nursing home survey. Um, you, if you're familiar with LTC Focus, you might say, well, then why are you recreating what LTC Focus has already done? And so um, LTC Focus uh, is for all residents of a given nursing home, whereas we've derived measures specifically um, uh, based on residents with dementia in a given nursing home. So again, we're the National Dementia Workforce Study, so we wanted to come up with these dementia-specific measures. So lots of data resources. Um, at this point, the bulk of them are available for the um, Community Clinician Survey and the Nursing Survey. So nursing home survey. There are a few resources like these available specifically for home health agencies that are registered for CMS, um, registered with CMS. And then like Joanne mentioned, we'll be working on this sort of zip code trick with assisted living to try and develop some of these, some more of these resources for the assisted living survey. How do you get to the data? So we'll have um, public use versions of the, the individual respondent uh, surveys will be available through something called NACTA, which is an NIA supported archive of aging related data and data sources. Um, it's really simple. You just register on NACTA, um, like literally it's like your email address and your name is all, all you need to do to be able to download, to find and download documentation and data through NACTA. And then if you want to link the surveys with either the administrator survey or any of the other data sources that I just walked you through, that'll all be through this NIA funded linkage platform. We are currently in the process of getting set up with them and sorting through all the details so that they'll all be ironed out by March of 2025, uh, which is our aim for when the survey data and the linked data sources will be available for use. To reiterate a point that Joanne made at the very beginning, the whole goal of this project is not for research that Joanne and I or our co-investigators are doing. It's to create a data resource for other researchers to be able to use. Um, so to that end, all of the data are free. Um, that includes any of the linked data that I just walked through. Um, this is particularly hopefully appealing uh, for researchers interested in using the CMS data, which if you just want to, like if you have an R01 and you're purchasing access to CMS data, it is prohibitively expensive. Um, this is all free. So any of the linked data that we talked about, including beneficiary level CMS data through this NIA linkage platform, it's, it's all free. 
Um, we have a call out now for pilot awards. The deadline for that is on November the 1st. Um, so again, part of the goal is to really generate and create a community of data users. And so um, the RFA stipulated these pilot awards with really significant funding of up to $100,000 in direct costs. Um, as we build the resources available, that will include webinars and information sessions at a scientific meeting uh, uh, near you, hopefully. Um, again, so we can help people understand what's what's there um, and and build this community of data users. And then finally, we'll we'll begin having annual um, workforce related research meetings uh, that'll begin in year three. So we're just at the start of year two. So that would uh, start year three will be 25 into 26. So I went through, I, I think between Joanne and I, we've covered some uh, much of this, but data collection began the very end of August. RTI, we uh, have the fortune of working with RTI and the community clinician, nursing home staff and assisted living staff surveys. And then DLH is working on the home care survey. Again, data collection is underway and basically we'll go through the rest of the calendar year mentioned the RFA for the pilot awards with a deadline of November 1st. Our aim is for um, data to be available this spring from the first year of data. And then we'll be on an annual cycle with annual data releases uh, through the first five years of the project. Um, so please check out the website uh, and, and uh, send us an email to join the mailing list. And then we have plenty of time for questions if folks have questions. Hello, thank you, Donovan, and thank you, Joanne. That was a very informative study. Uh, that said, it's time for a Q&A session. Does anyone in the audience have a question? And if y'all don't, I do. So it looks like in the, um, the Q&A, uh, good question on uh, who's completing the really i'll say all of the all of the worker surveys so the nursing home survey and i see she already said that i answered it so uh chime in megan if, uh margaret if if that was unclear but um just to restate it uh it's it's both the the workers will complete it and we're doing the sampling approach um like joanne explained is this rostering process and we didn't want the employers to select their employees that would be responding because obviously that you'd be worried about who the employer would choose. And so we're having this rostering process where essentially we um, get a roster or a list of employees in the job classes of interest. And then we, the survey team, um, select the respondents and then reach out to them independently. We didn't want the employer to pick and we also didn't want the employer to know who among their staff um, are completing the survey. So staff, hopefully selected by us, are completing the survey. And then separately, there's an administrator survey. And that, yeah, that was exactly our concern. Yeah, Joanne, I think you're muted. Still muted. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, there we go. So um, yes, we totally agree, um, Margaret, with your concern about um, employers picking the workers or whatever. Um, you know, we we are exploring with some employers who are saying, you know, for privacy reasons, they're concerned about sharing contact information for their staff, and so we're exploring different strategies that we might be able to use to. Um, address their concerns about that while at the same time addressing our concerns about inadvertently creating bias or perhaps an organization inadvertently trying to create bias um, in who is sampled. So it's, um, you know, the, the year one, there is um, a lot of experience that people on our team have of using this kind of a sampling and survey strategy that we're drawing from. But, um, you know, there, these are relationships that we're developing with these organizations. And so there is a, a certain mix of persuasion of having them understand why this is important and could be helpful to them and trying to be creative together to make sure that the goals of the study to generate a nationally representative rigorous 
population of people in the survey data um, is, you know, is met in the end. That, that's the big picture goal. Hey. Oh, so another question came in about whether this project will result in state level snapshots and projections. Um, you know, I would say in year one for the um, organizational and agency staff, um, we are saying that the results should be nationally representative, but I do not believe that the N is really going to support doing state level analyses. Um, you know, I, I, we are, our sample does cover rural, urban, and different geographic regions of the country, but depending on how the, how the uh, response rates go, you know, we can't, even if we had two nursing homes from every state, this year one, it's going to be 100 nursing homes. So two nursing homes from any state could not possibly be representative of that state when all is said and done. Um, so, so I think in the first year, definitely not state level. And we as a research team are not developing projections. The, this, you know, we are not um, being paid to do research. We are being paid to create data infrastructure for you all to do research. So if these data could be used to develop national projections related to the workforce, that would be great for people to pick up the data and run with it in that direction. Um, in year one, it's probably more feasible to consider doing that type of work with the clinician survey where the first year sample size is gonna be very large. You know, I have a quick follow up on, on, and actually Meg kind of hit on these a little bit. Do you anticipate sampling any non-licensed professionals who are capturing their responses given your methodology that you're asking for a roster of people? Yeah, all of the direct care workers are not licensed. Mm -hmm. I mean, in general, that workforce yeah. of nursing assistants, personal care aides, um, you know, and for assisted living facilities, there are a lot of different kinds of workers that are involved in direct care. Um, some organizations that are smaller typically have activity staff also are helping with activities of daily living and they're helping with, you know, arts and crafts and they're showering people. And in other facilities, those jobs might be very separated and very delineated. So for assisted living, it's a pretty, um, broad set of job titles that we ask them to you know help roster um, whereas for home care and for nursing homes it's a you know rns lpns nursing assistants home health aides it's a little narrower a group of people that we're asking for them to um, roster for us but yes definitely includes unlicensed people which is a workforce that we know so little about because they aren't licensed and they're hard to find and hard to survey. Yes, definitely. And Catherine has a question for you. Yeah, I, I would uh, love to answer that one, Catherine. So um, no, VA operated nursing homes are not in the sample frame. And just to be clear, uh, do you mean sort of states veterans homes or do you actually mean like VA, VHA type of facilities? Um, Again, the answer is no either way. Um, I'll say I was on, uh, so I have a VA appointment and I was, was on call about a month ago and it was just, it was 48 hours of dementia care basically. And so I would actually really love um, to, to figure out a way to try to do this in the VA. I don't know if institutional priorities and funding are such that that could happen, um, but I, I would actually really love to be able to do that maybe once things settle down a little bit with the, the NIH version of the project, we can think about the VA expansion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, Catherine, we, we talked about doing um, the VA when we were crafting the initial proposal, but um, we came to the conclusion that the complexity of what we were trying to do already and the number of IR, you know, the IRB issues and the numbers of different organizations that we were recruiting was such that adding to it the um, VA approvals, VA IRBs, et cetera, was um, a bridge too far for your, you know, for, for this um, 
but totally in the long term, um, we would love to be able to bring VA into the overall sample and to the overall study. Um, the VA has got such fantastic electronic health record data and a long history of people using it in addition to the payroll data. I mean, I mean, you know, Catherine, as well as anybody, what fantastic rich data lives within the VA. So there's a lot of opportunity there if we can yeah. think about that in the future. And we would encourage anybody, if there is an opportunity in the VA for an HSR&D grant, to um, use these questionnaires to do a study within the VA, please go for it. Um, you know, the questionnaires are all publicly available. Um, you know, there may be opportunities to um, think about, you know, how are there ways that the data could be merged or compared between the VA and other organizations. So, um, you know, so if there was opportunity for VA HSR and D um, funding, you know, we, we would be happy to encourage that and support it in any way that made sense. Well, that brings up another question. Why didn't you survey hospitals? So we had many, so part of the challenge with this was sort of drawing the boundaries mm -hmm. around uh, what we could manage uh, in the first five years. And uh, so there's, uh, you know, social workers, hospice care, adult day, occupational therapy, physical therapy, like there's all kinds of disciplines that ideally would be included, but aren't yet. Um, and I think there are also settings that ideally would be included like the VA, um, but also like hospitals that aren't yet. Um, so I think, and also even from a, then from a sort of practical standpoint, thinking about for clinicians, uh, say outpatient delivery um, and the types of questions you would ask that clinician are very, very different from the types of questions you would ask someone working in a hospital in an inpatient setting. Um, those, we didn't exclude we, um, people who are purely hospitalists, purely inpatient based are not in the sample frame. But if you do provide uh, care in an outpatient setting or in a residential nursing home setting, and also happen to provide inpatient care, you are in the survey. Um, but we just thought purely hospital-based practice, um, hospital-based practice was just sort of too different, um, was a little bit beyond what we thought was feasible, realistically, at least in the first year. And then the other point that uh, um, is just a challenge is thinking about the outcomes um, and tying outcomes of a hospitalization where maybe the hospitalist took care of the patient for five days and then they rotated off and somebody else took care of them. It just gets very murky trying to look at the outcomes of that hospital-based care. So a lot of reasons, but it's definitely on our radar to include in the future. Thanks, Donovan. <clears throat> Are there any more questions from our audience? If there is none from them, I have, I have another question too. <laughs> Hey, well, you know, I'm kind of curious a little bit more about the methodology. That is, you hear a lot about survey fatigue and how it's becoming more and more difficult to get a good response rate. Now, for a number of these surveys, you're kind of, you know, I guess you're going to the facility first, then sampling within. But the community cl clinician one will be directly to the clinicians, correct? Well, what types of procedures are you going to use to, you know, hopefully get like that 50% response rate? Yeah, for the community clinicians, the approach looks, you know, kind of the Dillman method type approach that's very common in survey research. Um, our, our data collection partner, RTI, has done a lot of work to try to find email addresses for clinicians because those aren't in the public records. Um, and also to verify their contact information overall, to do contacts by paper mail, email. Um, there have been initial letters that have gone out at this point. And um, people who complete the survey are being offered a $100 incentive, 
which, you know, for a clinician's time isn't a huge amount of money, but it is about a 20 minute survey. So it's, you know, it's a pretty nice incentive that hopefully will help there. Um, we also are reaching out to various professional organizations um, that, you know, that, that may have some affinity with clinician groups and, and this kind of a webinar to help get the word out about the survey and its importance and um, why it's worth people's time on it. Um, you know, home care aides and direct care workers are actually a group where there is um, well-known challenges for getting them to respond. And of course, getting organizations to put in the time and effort that we're asking them to do also is an issue. So the organizations are um, being an offered an incentive, I believe it's $2,000 to participate um, in this, to thank them, to support the time that they spend um, putting together rosters and so on. And if for some reason they are not able to accept a cash payment, you know, we're again being creative in our relationship with them, you know, can we send you pizza gift cards for your staff pizza parties or whatever. And then for the um, respondents of the survey, the nurses and the direct care workers, it's also a $100 incentive to complete the survey. And it was our sense and also some of the experts that we were able to consult with that not only is that a great incentive for especially the direct care workers, um, but also the, the nature of the incentives and the size of them may help encourage some of their organizations to support participation in the survey because they recognize what a benefit it could be to their own workforce, both in the knowledge gained, but also the um, incentive payment. So, interestingly, from some of the data collection uh, feedback we've been getting, the incentive size is such that actually um, they have some initial concern that it's fraud. And so they have to reassure potential organizations that like we're, this is legit and it's above board and we're not you know, trying to take advantage of you so that we were not expecting that as a as a possibility. Yeah. We have to assure them we're not asking for their bank account information and we're not we're not going to sell them Apple gift cards or whatever the latest scam is. Um, but um, but yes, you know, as, as I said, the, these are really um, for a lot of these organizations, it's a relationship we have to develop with them for them to appreciate that this is an important study. It's being for, sponsored by NIA um, that, you know, the the leadership is an experienced you know, team of scholars and that we are really going to protect their privacy as an organization and the privacy of their workers. Um, and we take that responsibility very seriously. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a question from Xiao Chu. It's nice to see you at the webinar, Xiao Chu. I, it's always a pleasure. Um, asking about the project scope, including the experience with um, non-paid caregivers such as family members, or caregivers who are self-employed. Um, there are um, some questions for um, the direct care worker and nursing, you know, the facility and, and agency staff. Um, there's one or two questions right now about their interactions with family members and care partners of the clients and the residents that they serve. And we are um, looking into expanding out those questions for the second year. Um, for, for paid workers who are self-employed, that is one of our puzzles, as I mentioned. Um, so we are looking into the different ways that individuals um, hire people for their, for their care needs and for their support needs. Um, the Alzheimer's Association um, Family Caregiver and Care Partner Interest Group um, has been helpful, as was the Early Stage Dementia Group that they convene. Um, they have provided us with information about how they find support staff, whether um, a number of them have pointed to care.com, some of them have pointed to different kinds of agencies and bulletin boards. Um, we know that there are some training organizations also that um, kind of facilitate training opportunities for independently employed workers. And so we're, we're starting, we're in the early stages of exploring um, what options we might use. And we might also engage in some snowball sampling because we know that a lot of care networks of independently employed people 
um, you know, kind of share the information around. I, I think this is, these networks can look very similar as they do for childcare, like nannies and for housekeepers, where, um, you know, I think many of us who have, have friends or who ourselves have had, say, childcare, will know somebody that has a nanny or know somebody who's in uh, in-home care and will say, well, who are you using? And do they have a friend? And um, do they have another spot in their home and whatever types of informal networks? And we know a lot of those networks are gray market and that that is um, really an unknown workforce because it's a gray market. And we, we are hoping that over the next few years, we can figure out how to get some information about what's happening in that market. Some of that might come from the longitudinal surveys that when people maybe quit a nursing home, are they getting directly hired through the gray market and um, and maybe we can find some of the folks that way. So we welcome your ideas um, as you know for people who have ideas about how to approach this and, and how to strategize because it's not an easy problem. Hey, anyone else. Well, we can give everyone just you know a couple minutes to chime in if in case something like uh, comes to mind. But what's the big takeaway? regarding this study, like if you have a closing thought you, you want to share with the audience today, this goes to both Donovan and Joanne, what would it be? Uh, let's see. I guess it would be that this is a tremendous opportunity from the NIA to really understand um, the workforce in in a way that you know i i think uh clinicians and the people providing the healthcare really have been a huge black box in research and i think for dementia in particular i i was always struck through my training um you know whether it's who 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 owns patients with dementia is it geriatricians is it primary care is it psychiatry is it neurology but then also the like well, the once, uh, however many months they come and see me is so much less important than all of the time and all of the other different types of clinicians that are interacting with them and providing care. And that's really what they need more than the every six month visit with me. And so this is just a remarkable opportunity to really try and again, build this resource for researchers to use to understand this really critical um, health and policy problem um, that, that the U S needs to figure out how to address over the next couple of decades. Yep. And I, I'll add to that, that, um, that these data, I mean, literally it's in the field. Now the data are coming soon. So if you are interested and have time in your schedule, take a look at the pilot award call for proposals. Um, the deadline for those is going to come pretty quick. Um, but it also is not too early for you to think about writing an R01 or an R03 or a dissertation proposal um, to, to use these data. And um, you know, as, as we've said, we're building data infrastructure. We're not being paid by NIA to actually do the research ourselves. And so, um, so we want to assure people that we're not going to like try to scoop you. Um, you know, we, we really do want to support the research community in getting into the data and generating the kind of novel information that we need so that we can best serve people living with dementia as those numbers are expected to grow so much in the future. All right, thank you. And, and those um, pilot grants are due November 1st, I see. So it is approaching quickly, but hopefully some people on this call today, this webinar applies for them. Well, I, I think we're pretty much about at the end, unless there's any last minute questions. So I'll just wish both of y'all good luck with this uh, very important study. I mean, you know, there a lot of knowledge could be generated from this, obviously. There, there's a ton of questions and thank you for giving us the chance to share this information with, um, with the Workforce Center audience. Definitely. And thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.